Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Joseph Glor, your host, and we have a very special show for you today. We are recording to your radio waves from inside our hotel in Milan, Italy. The Word on Fire production team is currently on location filming for our documentary series, Catholicism, The Pivotal Players. I'm here with the leader of our sojourn, the illustrious Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, how are you feeling? Joe, I'm feeling good. It's good to be on the program with you today, and good to be here in a beautiful Milano. Has the jet lag worn off for you yet? I'm kind yeah. of getting back to normal today. Yeah, pretty much. I struggle a little bit with it. I was I was up late last night, like about midnight or 1230, and then I finally got to sleep, but I'm getting there. Before we get any further along, I want to mention we're over here and we've been dropping in all sorts of content. If you've been on social media, we've been putting in tons of videos. Uh, We've been uploading YouTube videos. We have this website where you can follow along on this trip with us. It's called PivotalPlayersFilming.com. Filming, F-I-L-M-I-N-G. PivotalPlayersFilming.com gives you an all-access pass to see everything that we're doing over here. We have exclusive YouTube videos that you can't see anywhere else. So if you want to kind of join along with us on this journey, make sure you go to PivotalPlayersFilming.com and sign up there, and you'll get tons of free access to great video content. So, Bishop, this is not your first go around Europe. You've been on these trips before. We have the Catholicism series, the other Pivotal Players, uh, Volume 1. Is there anything new under the sun? Is this kind of old hat at this point for you to travel around and go to these places? Oh, no, it's always a joy. You know, I, of course, lived in Europe. I was in Paris for three years doing my doctoral studies, travel a lot during those years. Then I taught twice in Rome. I was there for two, you know, long sojourns of about three or four months. So I've had a lot of experience uh, living in Europe. Been here, as you say, a lot. Uh, but no, there's always something new and fresh. At Rome, we just, you know, spent, what, the last five days there. Uh, is just inexhaustible, and I've explored it many, many times. Never get tired of it. Always delighted to go back. Always find something new. Um, now it's my first time in Milan, so all my travels in Europe, I've never been to Milan except the airport to change planes. So I'm really excited about seeing this place. Yeah, it's been a an adventure for me. You know, I've been to France, I've been to England, I've been to some parts of Spain. But I have never been to Italy, so it's been an extraordinary experience. And I think everyone on the team is excited about the locations we've been visiting. It's been it's been beautiful. A lot of the people that have been here have been with you since gosh, when since when two thousand eight? Yeah, some of them. So our team is uh, is terrific, and we started filming right the first Catholicism episode in the summer of two thousand eight, and that was in Jerusalem. And then we went all over the world. Now picked up with this series. Um, a number of people, you know, Veronica uh, Penzo, who was our production manager on this trip, uh, was with us back in 2008, our first time over here in Rome for the Catholicism series. And she's been with us many times now on these Italian trips. Um, John Cummings is our great cameraman. John worked at NBC and has been with us again all over the world. His eye, you know, determines a lot of the look of the of the series. Um Giacomo, Giacomo has been a sound guy for us now over here in Italy a number of times. Very good man, speaks very good English, and is a lot of fun uh, to be with. Um, uh, Matt Leonard, who is the director of this series, as he was director of the Catholicism series. Matt's with us, and he's been around since 2008. Joey, you're here, of course, doing uh, a lot of content for us, especially on social media, which is great. You're also a um, still photographer, taking a lot of pictures of, of the shoots, you know. Of course, Father Steve is here, the great CEO of Word on Fire, and he's kind of the executive producer of this whole uh, operation. And uh, Jack Thornton, Jack is um, kind of managing a lot of the practicalities of the trip. Um, So it's a great team. I've been with many of these people for many years, and I think we've got it down to kind of a science now. We know how to do these trips. They're tricky, you know, to manage all the the, uh, logistics of these trips and – for me, the memorization of all these different speeches and the sure. kind of the performance of these stand-ups is is always a little bit challenging. It's a bit like you know being an actor; you've got to uh, perform your scene, you know. Right. So anyway, they're they're great. I've enjoyed these trips, but they're they're also uh, they're a lot of work. 
You know what strikes me is it's, it's kind of a skeleton crew. Yeah. When you look at the scope of what we're doing, we're traveling the world, super high production values. We've got these beautiful locations, these grand shots. Yeah. I bet it surprised a lot of people that we, we really are going with a, a very base crew. Yeah, and that's what was true of the last series as well. You hire people on the ground in the various places you go. So Veronica over here and, and uh, Giacomo. Um, but yeah, the main crew that we bring over is, is quite small. Now, the beautiful thing is with the, all the advances in, in camera technology, uh, these wonderful pictures are produced by a fairly small camera, you know, that, that, uh, John can carry in his carry on, uh, you know, luggage. So it, you don't need a giant, you know, Hollywood production size crew. Um, but it's also a testament to, the high professional quality of these people that they can uh, uh, do this at such a high level. You know, once the cameras stop rolling, we actually do finally get a little bit of time to kind of take a mental break, especially you with memorizing all the the stand-ups, all the scripts and everything like that. And we've been able to kind of get some walking done and you've been kind enough to give me a tour since it's my first time in Italy. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of the places we've stopped by so far outside of the locations that everyone's going to hear about uh, on last week's episode and and from the website. I was actually kind of delighted. I didn't know that you'd never been to Rome before until I think we got on the plane. Right, yeah. So uh, I was delighted to be able to show you some of these things. The first night, I think our hotel was over near the Piazza Barberini, if people know Rome at all. And I decided I love to walk. And so I said, let's go for a long walk. And our first stop was the Trevi Fountain, which is not at all far from the hotel. But from there, I think we went over to... Um, um, well, we went to... The so, Pantheon. Yeah. We went to the Pantheon, which is my favorite building from classical Rome. It's the best preserved of the classical buildings. And then in the neighborhood of the Pantheon, we have the great church of... San Luigi de Francesi, the St. Louis of the French. And that's where two great Caravaggios, three great Caravaggios can be found, but including the magnificent conversion of Matthew, which is one of the great religious paintings, period, I think, in, in the West. So we went there. We also went over to the Piazza Navona, I think, which is just a few steps away, and the Church of St. Agnes in Agony, where you can see the uh, the little... Um, skull of St. Agnes, which is very moving to me, this young girl that was martyred back in the classical Roman period, and she's honored there. So the Piazza Navona, which is a great place of restaurants and nightlife and fun and all that, but what anchors it is this little girl who was courageous enough to defend her, her Catholic faith, even when her life was threatened, you know. So it was very moving. Didn't we go then um, over to a San Andrea de la Valle? Yeah. Right? And that's a church that uh, uh, I had walked by a thousand times. I'd never gone in until a year ago, just about a year ago. Um, I was invited to give a talk to the English-speaking priests who were in Rome for the Jubilee for priests. And it was there. And, of course, St. Um, Andrew, Father Steve reminded me of this, since St. Andrew was the brother of Peter, that church is kind of like St. Peter's Jr. It, it looks a lot like St. Peter's, that very high Baroque style, a lot of gold a decoration, of an impressive dome, yeah. you know. So we went there, and I think then we make our way back up then toward the Church of the Jesu, right? The uh, Yeah, that's where we ended. The Jesuit headquarters church, which is very beautiful, high Baroque style. Uh, it's where Ignatius himself is buried and where the arm of St. Francis Xavier can be found, the arm with which he baptized all these thousands of people. And I, whenever I go there, I, I think of all my uh, uh, Jesuit friends over the years. I always pray for them. Um, and I just found it very moving to pray at the tomb of Ignatius, who is also one of our pivotal players. I, maybe maybe next summer we'll be filming for him. And then Francis Xavier, when I was over by his relic, I thought, well, okay, we're about the same business here. You know, you got in a ship to do it a long time ago, and with far greater danger than I've ever faced and far greater courage I've ever showed, but still we have the same basic task of trying to bring the gospel to people. So anyway, I did. I found that very moving to be there. If you're just tuning in, we're recording this episode of the Word on Fire show from Milan, Italy. I'm here with Bishop Barron talking about PivotalPlayersFilming.com. It's your all-access pass to our epic new film project. And when we were in the car ride over to the train station, 
it's just you were t- we were talking about how this is certainly not a vacation. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. We're just trying to pile in and get to these other places. But it also feels a lot like a pilgrimage yeah. to me. What, what's the difference between a vacation, say, and a pilgrimage? Yeah, well, pilgrimage is you're going to a sacred spot uh, to pray. You're, you're going purposely to a holy place so you can um, commune with the, the saint who's represented there. And that's important to me. Like, you know, we've been at also the Church of St. Augustine where the tomb of Monica is. But when you pray at the tomb of Monica, you're not just, you know, looking at pretty things. You're communing with St. Monica. Um, and that we were yesterday up at Monte Cassino, and uh, that's where St. Benedict is buried. So you commune there with him. Um, we're now in Milan. It's, again, my first time here. We'll soon be over at the Church of St. Ambrose, where Ambrose himself is is buried. So a pilgrimage is going to a holy place to commune with the saint who is uh, either buried there or whose relics are there. Um, so it's not a vacation. There's, you know, elements of it, I suppose. I think it's, a, it's an enjoyable thing to do. You often go with people in a sort of festive spirit. But it's not just to relax, it's to pray, ultimately. These trips are, I think you're right in saying that, they're not a vacation because... Uh, there's a lot of work involved, and usually it's getting up pretty early and getting on the, the bus or the train or whatever we're doing, uh, getting ourselves over there, setting up. In my case, it's it's memorizing all these speeches, having to perform them. Um, so no, it's not a vacation, but it is a bit like a pilgrimage because we're going to very beautiful, holy places associated with the saints. So you know that's a that's a great part of it. What's been your favorite place so far since we've been here? Yeah, certainly Subiaco, which I'd never been to before. Uh, Subiaco is about 40 miles east of Rome, and it's the, uh, the cave that the young Benedict went to to escape from the moral kind of turpitude of Rome, but also to find his spiritual path, and, and he did. He, he begins, you might say, his monastic career there. As people came to him attracted by his holiness— the first monastic communities are being formed, at least in the West. And then, you know, from there he kind of sets out to, to uh, launch his spiritual career. Um, the place physically is very beautiful. I wasn't expecting something as grand and magnificent as Subiaco. I thought, oh, there'll be the cave and a little, maybe, you know, shrine around it. And, yeah, it was breathtaking. It's this monastery on the cliffside, which is full of symbolism, of course. You know, like when you're... You're hanging on to the edge. Monks are kind of edgy people. They go to the edge of human life and experience. It's an it's a a place of trust, of dependency, you know, upon God. The sheer rock uh, cliff face, you know, and then the remnants of the cave itself still there, you know, and a little statue of Benedict in the cave, um, and these wonderful frescoes. I didn't realize all that was there. Wonderful frescoes from the late 14th century. Uh, including a, a portrait of Francis of Assisi, who visited there. Um, so anyway, I thought Subiaco was really cool and, and really rich spiritually. I found it very moving. Yeah, I think that was my favorite place so far. And that St. Francis fresco was painted during his time, maybe while yeah. he was actually visiting. They think it was painted from life. It's, yeah. uh, one of the monks said, uh, you know, just stand there and <laughs> I'll paint your It was portrait. mind-blowing. And we had yeah. great Mauricio, Father Mauricio, yeah. showing us around. He was he's just a, so, so a enthused. Guy. Yeah. yeah. You can tell he's given that tour a million times and it's never gotten old. It never gotten old. Yeah. No, that yeah. was that's true. Passionate about it. So we've been praying all along the way for the Word on Fire followers, yeah. especially the donors who helped right. make this trip possible. So... We, we want you listeners to know that, you know, you're constantly in Bishop's prayers. He's always stopping. And I remember St. Monica's tomb you mentioned particularly was moving. It was moving for me as well. What's your prayer life been like uh, since you've been going on this trip? Okay. Well, it's, it's, a, it's different, you know, because my usual rhythm is I wake up in the morning. The first thing I do is a, is a holy hour in my chapel, in my residence, which I really, I really savor that. Um, the day begins with an, an hour of intense prayer. I do part of my office there, but... Mm-hmm often the rosary or the Jesus prayer or just sort of silent meditation. I can't do that on these trips because we're in the hotels and we're leaving early and all that. But what I try to do then is as we go to these holy places and the Blessed Sacrament is there, I kind of break up the holy hour, you know, and I'll, I'll try to spend some time so that it's not just work. I'm going to go and set the lights and memorize the speech and let's film. I, I want to make sure that I'm always praying at the places we go. 
and I really mean that. I, I've said I, I'm praying for all the Word on Fire supporters, all the people that we reach, uh, all of our donors, as you say, who make this possible. Uh, and I do that as best I can. I, I, I remember everybody and try to pray for you. Um, so th- that's how I, I think it, it happens now is the holy hour, the, the focus time gets kind of broken up. But you're in these holy places and in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and the relics of the great saints. So that's, you know, that's a wonderful thing. I think anyone who's gone on a vacation to an extraordinary location, you know, even if it's you know some beautiful lake in the U.S., it's always good to take a minute and take a breath, realize where you are. Yeah, you know, focus on the moment, be in this moment because we're working. You know, we're we're busy. We're focused on. I'm making sure we get the pictures, upload yeah. everything. Everyone's got their job. But even when I'm on vacation, I'm thinking, oh, I better get this selfie of myself, you know. So <laughs> I think people need to just take a moment, especially in our culture where everyone's capturing everything on a phone, to just yeah. breathe it in, right? Absolutely. And it's, you know, it's a great opportunity at these uh, holy places. If you're just tuning in, we're recording this episode of the Word on Fire show from Milan, Italy. I'm here with Bishop Barron, and we're talking about PivotalPlayersFilming.com. It's, again, your all-access pass to our epic new film project. I noticed that you've been praying your office as well. So wherever we're at, in a myriad of locations, you'll see Bishop Barron on the plane, on the train ride to get here to Milan, a car ride, wherever we're at, we'll take a break. You'll open up that book, and you're always praying in the office. How does it help you, or what's the point? Why is it so important to you to get that done yeah, on the scheduled time? It's very important to me. It's one of the promises, of course, that you make when you're ordained a priest. Uh, you promise that you will pray the office faithfully. And you're praying not primarily for yourself. You're praying for the church. But it's one of the great obligations you have as a, as a priest. And I've always, you know, in the 31 years I've been a priest, I've always taken that very seriously, and I feel a kind of, I call it holy compulsion, you know? So like today, I've prayed uh, the Office of Readings, morning prayer, and, and midday prayer, you know? But I have to pray Vespers and then Compline. And uh, I'll do it at some point, you know, today. Maybe maybe we're not far now from the, uh, the great cathedral here in Milan, maybe in front of that cathedral, who knows? But we're back in my room. But I, I feel a sort of holy compulsion to do the office. I, I, I would feel... I, I would be sort of bothered in conscience, you know, if I went to bed tonight and I had not prayed the rest of the office. So I take it seriously. Um, it, to me, it's not a burden, though. Uh, I, I enjoy the office, and I find it, you know, very powerful. Um, and I love praying it in front of the Blessed Sacrament or in these holy places. It is a elevating thing. The great thing, though, too, you mentioned the airplane, because the great thing about the office is you you bring your breviary, or, or now in many cases you bring your iPhone. I have my breviary on the iPhone, so that wherever you wherever you are, wherever you go, you can pray it. Uh, you're in the back seat of a car. You're you're in the airplane. You're in the train. Uh, but you know, all right, here's my moment to pray. Um, so it, it means a lot to me, and it's it's a act of, of pastoral ministry because it's, it's a prayer for the church. There's a lot of different apps that have this available for anyone to download, right? So this is something our listeners could get into the rhythm of doing, too. It's not just for sure. priests, right? That's right. Priests are obliged to pray it, but, but uh, you know, all people of all the baptized are invited to pray the Liturgy of the Hours with the Church or pray part of it, maybe. Uh, priests are obliged to pray the, all five, you know, hours. But, um, you know, say you, you get it and you're going to pray morning prayer now for the next year or maybe during Lent, I'm going to say I'm going to pray the whole office. Sure. Priests are obliged, but everyone's invited. And one of the reasons priests are obliged is because the, the, you have to pray for everyone who can't pray. You said yeah. something like that? No, I think day? that's right. Is as part of the beauty of the Psalms, because, of course, the heart of the Liturgy of the Hours are the Psalms. And the Psalms show you the whole range of human emotions, feelings, thoughts in regard to God. There are Psalms of praise, Psalms of thanksgiving, Psalms of, of petition, Psalms of anguish, yeah, Psalms of mm-hmm. anger, Psalms of... Everything, the whole range of human anger at God. I remember sure, reading some, course. which I always thought is this is what He wants me to sure. do. Is read this. But see, here's the thing: let's say you're praying that, and you say, "Well, I don't feel really angry at God right now," but someone in the body of Christ does, well, yeah. who maybe can't pray or hasn't even thought about that. Or you say, I, "I don't feel desolate and depressed," but somebody, trust me, right now, in the body of Christ does, and so you're praying on their behalf. You're you're giving their feeling voice. That's lovely. Yeah. 
We've been doing a lot of film work on Benedict around Rome, and now that we're shifting more of our focus towards St. Augustine here, we gave people a little bit of background about both of them in the last episode, but we didn't talk much about St. Ambrose. And mm-hmm. I feel like St. Ambrose is kind of the saint of the day. He's been on our lips yeah. kind of throughout the day. Let's talk a little bit about him. What is his impact on Augustine and the church? Yeah, it was huge. Of course, we're in his town. I mean, Milan really is the town of, of Ambrose. He was the bishop of Milan, um, so elected not long, not too long before Augustine uh, came here. He baptizes Augustine. The, the pivotal role he played for St. Augustine was the, the young man comes now to Milan He's uh, a philosopher, he's a rhetorician, he's longing for a um, glorious career as, you know, we'd say like a kind of a courtier of the emperor. The emperor was up here in, in Mediolanum, the Romans called it, um, and Augustine is a, is a guy on the, on the make, you know, he's, he's smart, he's well-connected, he's ambitious, and he comes here to Milan because that's where the emperor was. This, it wasn't Rome in those days so much, it was here, it was the center of, of the empire. So it's like a young man you know, going to Washington or going to you know, London or something today, and they want to make their way. So Augustine comes. At the same time, he's, he's a spiritual searcher. He's an intellectual. He's transitioning out of his time as a Manichae. He was a nine-year uh, devotee of, of Manichaeism, which is this sort of um, dualist philosophy. He's on the cusp of kind of thinking his way out of that. Well, a major player was Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, whom Augustine went to hear because he had heard, oh, he's a fine rhetorician. And Augustine's like, all right, let me I'll check him out. Yeah. See how good this guy yeah, is. Exactly. So he comes to the cathedral, which is now not far from where we're sitting, to hear. And he's, you know, he's impressed by the rhetorical skill of this guy. But then what happens is he finds himself going back. And he knew it wasn't like just to, you know, he sized him up. All right, this, this guy's pretty good, this yeah. sort of thing. But he was going back because he realized it wasn't just the rhetoric. It was the content that he was becoming interested in. And Ambrose is teaching the young Augustine how to read the Bible. Because Augustine's an intellectual, right? And uh, he's put off by the Bible, especially the Old Testament, which seemed to be so crude and kind of mythological and a lot of crazy stuff from his his uh, advanced philosophical Roman perspective. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, to a lot of people today you know, who yeah. read the Bible. But then Ambrose, from the pulpit of the cathedral here, began to teach him this symbolic, allegorical way to read the Bible. So that these stories opened up now in a way that was intellectually satisfying to Augustine. And that was a turning point in his journey toward the church. Um, it, it knocked down one of the major obstacles he was, he was feeling. Um, and then there's much more to that story, but it eventually leads to his um, conversion. And what, I, what I'm most looking forward to here, I haven't seen it yet, of course, is in the lower regions of the, um, of the Duomo, of the cathedral, we have the, the remains, the ruins, or what's left, of the baptistry where Ambrose baptized Augustine and making it one of the most pivotal spots in Europe, it seems to me, that someone of Ambrose's stature would have baptized someone of Augustine's stature who then had this civilization-shaping influence. That's no exaggeration. Civilization-shaping influence on all of Western uh, culture. So I'm really eager. I think tomorrow we're going to try to film there, and I'm just eager to see it. But that's that's the role that Ambrose played in Augustine's conversion. I'm I'm looking forward to tomorrow too. Going inside the church, we just saw the yeah. outside. It's, it's stunning, yeah. staggering yeah. to to see the facade. Even well, I guess the final question I'd have for you today is: uh, What do you miss most about the U.S. when you get back? Are you going to kind of kiss the ground, or are you are you do you kind of miss? No, I, I always every time I go on a trip to Europe or overseas, yeah. especially, I'm just always so grateful that I'm an American. I just love America, you know, and I'm just so like every time I love these other places too. Yeah, but there's no place in the world I would rather be no, from I mean, and live. It's just home. You it's know? our culture. You feel sure. home. Yeah, probably like to get a burger, you know, because I love Italian food. I, yeah. I often go very happily to Italian restaurants when I'm home. But when you're here for a long time and you're having nothing but, you know, pastas and pizzas and stuff. So I probably would get a burger when I get home. I look forward to that. Uh, no, I'm always happy to, to get back to. Mm-hmm. 
We do have a listener question today, Bishop Barron. It is from our very own Father Steve Gruno, our CEO, and he's going to come over and uh, take the mic from me right now and field this question. Bishop Barron, um, the two pivotal players that uh, the series will feature right now are Benedict and Augustine, and, and in a way, they're great Italians. Yeah. So what do they have to say to Italians today in terms of their own culture, their heritage? Yeah. Uh, uh, so what do Augustine and Benedict have to say to Italians today? Well, I think a lot, and you know, especially Benedict is, in fact, you know, an Italian, born, raised— on this peninsula, uh, went to school in Rome, then fled to Subiaco, then went to Monte Cassinos. I mean, he's an Italian, born and bred, a late Roman, we might say, you know. Um, and then Augustine has a has a crucial episode of his life here in Italy. He's buried in Italy, buried in Pavia. We'll go there in a couple of days. Um, both Rome and Milan are important to him, and of course, Ostia where his mother dies as they were making their way back to Africa. So, yeah, Italy is important for Augustine, too. And see, I would say, you know, it always kind of breaks my heart when I come over here to Europe because you have all these wonderful monuments to the faith, and you've got the graves of the great saints and apostles, the relics of these key figures, the most magnificent churches in the world, but yet the faith is not doing that great over here in Europe right now. And I don't need to rehearse all the statistics, but we all know that, um, you know, a secularism is coming to hold sway here. And that just always breaks my heart. I would hope that that Benedict and Augustine might awaken Italian people to the sense of their own spiritual heritage, what they've given to the world. I mean, in many ways, it's the, I mean, in almost every way, it's the faith of this part of the world that was brought over to the new world. So people like us can now benefit from it. To re- rediscover their own spiritual roots, I think, is so important because this this mind numbing and soul killing secularism is like a plague today. Because I see it all the time. I see it in our country all the time, especially young people. Yeah, and I mean both those things: mind numbing. Because as I've argued, the atheists uh, drop the questions right when they get really interesting. Right when the mind really wants to go all the way. They say, no, 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 dumb question. No, 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 it doesn't apply. And then it's soul-killing uh, secularism because, as Augustine taught us, the heart is wired for God. So if you, if you tell the human heart, oh, there's no God, don't worry about that, there's no transcendent, the heart goes through a sort of crisis. Now, look at much of Western culture. What do you see but a lot of broken hearts, you know, hearts that have been, that have been denied their natural um, uh, trajectory. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer, but I, I would hope that, that both Augustine and, and Benedict might awaken the Italian people, the people of Europe, to their own great spiritual sources. Well, I love the way that your heart for evangelism burns every time that we talk about the, the problem of this plague yeah. of secularism. So yeah. we're, it's very inspiring. We, we want to thank every single one of our listeners right now for tuning in to us here from Milan and we're going to get this up to you guys soon and we want to let you know that we felt the the communion of saints our holy friends all along this trip at these different holy sites where we see the relics but we've also felt your prayers as everything goes along day to day we need to make sure we get all this done so please do keep praying for us and I know Bishop will reiterate that and he does at the end of every single one of his videos so Keep us on your hearts and minds. And also, if you can make a donation, if you're able to do that, we really would love the help. You can go to wordonfire.org and make a donation there to help fund these large-scale projects. Also, don't forget to sign up at pivotalplayersfilming.com for access to free behind-the-scenes footage that can't be seen anywhere else. Well, here's signing out from Milan. Bishop Barron and I will be back with you next week for another episode of the Word on Fire show. Word on Fire.